Let's go ahead and stand as we begin our time of worship through song this morning. this we actually got an audition video in the mail 
Um, so I don't know, let's, let's check that out. <laughs> Bet you didn't see me here. <laughs> and that's exactly why I should be the next contestant. So far. <laughs> Survival skills? <laughs> I got them. Started this air fire with nothing but a squirrel bone and my own booty clint. I'm going to outwit, outplay, and outlast every one of my competitors. And no one's going to stand in my way. Not even my own flesh and blood. Mom, it's just a game! It's out! It's always dead! It's not a game to me, girly! <laughs> You don't actually have to create a audition video to be able to participate this weekend. What? Sorry, Miss Cody. But uh, but if you want to be a part of it, this could be a great time of fun and fellowship. Um, there's a sign up out in the breezeway, or you can come talk with me and just let me know. We kind of want to get a head count of how many people are going to be participating. We have about um, 30 or 30 something signed up so far. But look, this is not something you want to miss. Uh, and uh, first prize is going to win a, a new iPad Mini. Second prize, a $50 Visa gift card. And we've got about a dozen other gift cards that we're going to be giving out throughout the day. So um, lots of fun prizes and fellowship. Um, also, Coming up, a four-week marriage study that's going to be beginning Sunday, October 16th. That's next Sunday, um, called Staying in Love by uh, Andy Stanley. And there's a sign-up for that in the breezeway, and they'll be meeting at the Family Life Center, and child care is available for this. Also, uh, student ministry fall retreats are coming up. The middle school fall retreat is next weekend. And um, high school fall retreat is November 12th and 13th. So you can see Robert for more information on that. Or you can pick up a flyer on the student ministry table. We have class 101 that's coming around the corner again on October 23rd as a one-day um, workshop from 3 to 6.30. So if you're interested in learning more about Community Bible Church and exactly what we believe, um, this is the, the place to find out. And it's also the first step in becoming a member. So if you're interested in becoming a member here, um, taking this class is the first step to do so. And in my opinion, this is the best way to do it. A one-day class uh, for three and a half hours. Um, also, pillowcase, a pillowcase dress day for Operation Christmas Child. The women got together and were making dresses a, a few weeks back. And they're going to be finishing those up in the Agape House on October 24th. And look, if, if you are a woman that did not take part in it um, when they did it last time, that is all right if you want to be a part of it this time. Um, lots of fun and fellowship. I know my wife and mother-in-law were there, and they had a blast. So um, this is something that if you're a woman, that you definitely want to take part in. Um, lots of announcements today. October 30th. Trunk or treat, just around the corner here. Um, sign up for that in the breezeway if you want to host a trunk or help out in any way with the event. And um, also donations are being accepted for Operation Christmas Child. Supplies, money, or filled boxes. There's more information on that in the lobby with the packing party on Friday, November 11th. And um, also, Ms. Reba wanted me to, to let y'all know that um, the Thanksgiving food baskets are just around the corner. So if you'd like to help out with that in any way, um, you can talk with her. Um, she said the best way to help is monetary donations, and that way she can get um, the food and everything that's needed for that. Um, also, just a reminder that in the uh, foyer, we have our offering box for our regular members and attenders. 
um, to give for the ministries of this church. Your gifts and offerings is how we continue to operate here. So um, that's out there for those who want to um, use that. So let's go ahead and stand and go before the Lord in a word of prayer. Father God, we just come before you, God, and ask that you would just be with us in this place as we lift up our hearts and our voices in praise and worship. Father, we ask that, that nothing that we would do would bring honor or glory to ourselves, but that you would be lifted up and glorified through all of our efforts here today, God. So, Father, we praise you and worship you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, my God, oh, my God. I have a 
continue to lift up our voices as we praise our God and King, the light of the world. Here I am. 
As we've been getting into these middle chapters of the book of Revelation, uh, Pastor Bill has been walking us through this, this future time, uh, this time called the Tribulation. It's a seven-year time period where there are, are terrible things that are going to be going on uh, through this time of Tribulation. And uh, this is a time when I believe, and Pastor Bill has talked about this, that the church has been raptured, has been removed from this earth during this time uh, and is in heaven with God. Now, the rapture could take place at a different time. There's different people that believe that differently. Uh, wherever the rapture were to take place, one thing that's significant to understand during the tribulation is that there are some people through the tribulation that come to believe in Jesus, whether it's through the witness of hearing the gospel prior to this time, whether it's from picking up a Bible on their own and reading about it, whether it's from the, the 144,000, back in Revelation chapter 7, there were 144,000 witnesses that we were introduced to that, that are representatives of Christ during the tribulation that spread the message of salvation. And so there are people during the tribulation that come to put their faith in Christ. And so as this unfolds, as John, the disciple of Jesus that has received this revelation, uh, is seeing these things and recording them for us, in Revelation chapter 12, he's given kind of a big picture, a behind-the-scenes spiritual picture of what is going on, not just during this time, but has been going on through history. And so we're going to see that this morning. Uh, and then he's also going to bring us back into this time of tribulation and some specific things that are going on. But some key things that I want us to see here are that, that God protects his plan for the future and that God's plan for the future can give us encouragement in our present right now. Let me pray for us this morning. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for uh, your word that you have uh, given through your servant John. Uh, pray for our time this morning that as we go into this chapter that you would give uh, just clarity uh, to your word and all the things that are represented here. I pray that we would be encouraged uh, through our time in your word and we would see how we can have hope for our future uh, because of the message that you have for us here. I pray that we would leave this morning uh, more confident in our faith in Christ, that we would leave more bold uh, to share our own stories, and that we would have a greater understanding of the life that you call us to lead, and that we would leave with lives that seek to glorify you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So Revelation chapter 12 picks up. Uh, John is seeing a, a vision. He is given a, a sign. And Revelation chapter 12 uh, verse 1 through 6, this passage I, I gave a title of a very Revelation Christmas. And the reason for calling it that, you'll see as we get into uh, this part of the story. But Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. So John sees what he calls a great sign, a great sign in heaven. And I looked for different artwork that kind of depicted what this woman looked like. And a lot of the pictures really don't do justice, I think, to uh, what this woman looked like. Because the, the woman is described as pregnant and crying out in pain as she was about to give birth. She doesn't even look pregnant, first off. Um, and she certainly doesn't look like she's crying out in pain or about to give birth. So I don't think that's necessarily a great picture of what this woman looked like. You do see in that picture the moon under her feet and the crown of 12 stars, but I don't think that gives us an accurate picture of what's going on here. But there's this great sign of the woman, and then there's another sign. Uh, the next verse, verse 3, says, Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns, on its head. So there's this description of just a, a, an enormous dragon. And it's got seven heads, there's ten horns, there's all sorts of different things going on in this image. And so there are two signs that are given to us in these first three verses. There are two signs that are given to us. The first is a woman, that she is pregnant, she is in pain, she is about to give birth. And so that's the first of the great signs that is given in this passage. And then the second of these signs is a dragon, an enormous red dragon. And it's described with these seven heads, uh, ten horns, uh, seven crowns upon the thorns. And these are specifically called signs, which means they represent something else. These are signs that will represent something. And the woman, I think the best uh, way to describe or the best interpretation of this passage is that the woman represents Israel. The woman represents Israel. And there's a few different reasons why I think that is true. Uh, first off, this image of the woman with the moon and the sun and the 12 stars 
those symbols only appear one other place together in the Old Testament. And it's when Joseph, in Genesis 37, has his dream of the future of the, the stars and his mother and father bowing down to him. And it's a picture of the future nation of Israel given right there to Joseph. And so I think that's one reason it's a good description of Israel that stands for Israel. Another reason is that throughout the Old Testament, there are several times that the nation of Israel is described as a woman in labor, as a woman going through the pains of birth. That throughout the Old Testament, that's an image that God uses to talk about the nation of Israel. And so when the same image shows up here in the book of Revelation, it makes sense that that would be a representation of the nation of Israel. And there's some other reasons as well that we'll get into in just a minute. So the, the woman represents the nation of Israel, and the dragon represents Satan. And there's no mystery about that, because we're told that in verse 9, later on in the chapter, that the dragon represents Satan. And the term dragon is used 12 times in the New Testament. Every single time is in the book of Revelation, and every time it refers to Satan. And so we know that this dragon represents Satan. And there are seven heads that are, that are described, and ten horns, and uh, seven, seven crowns. And you can get into a lot of different details about what these uh, crowns stand for, what the heads stand for, what the horns stand for. Um, most scholars believe that these are representative of different kingdoms that appear throughout history, uh, and then of one kingdom that is still going to come later on. The big picture that I want you to get is that these uh, heads and the horns and the crowns represent kingdoms that are under the authority of Satan, both historical and a future kingdom as well, that will be under the authority and power of Satan. And so this dragon is presented, and then verse 4, we see its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. So there are these stars that sweep a third of the stars out of the sky. And I think the best interpretation of that, and there are several, but I think the best interpretation of that is that it's a description of, of the demons that would follow Satan after his rebellion against God. That he sweeps a third of those stars to follow him. And then we've got this image of the dragon standing in front of the woman. We've got a couple of pictures that uh, give, I think, a better description of that. There's this depiction of this dragon with seven heads. There this woman is about to give birth. But I want you to really try to picture that scene. You know, some of you are women that have been in labor. Uh, some of you are husbands that have seen your wives in labor. And I want you to picture being in that moment. Now, also at this time, there's no painkillers. There's no epidural going on during this as well. And so you've got this woman that's going through the pains of childbirth. And then suddenly this enormous, ferocious red dragon shows up. And the goal of the dragon is to devour the child that's about to come out. And it is an image that is full of, of fear and threatening, uh, and it's just this uh, really, uh, like I said, a, a frightening image of this uh, dragon coming against this woman and trying to devour her child as it is born. The verse goes on. It says in verse 5 that she gave birth to a son, a male child. So the woman gives birth to a son. There's a male child that is born. So here's some other key things here. There's the birth of a son. There's the birth of a son that happens. And the son represents Jesus. The son represents Jesus. The birth of the son, who is Jesus. And again, this is a behind-the-scenes look at what's going on in the, in the spiritual realm at the time of the birth of Jesus. That's why I, I call this the, the Christmas story as told in Revelation. When you hear the Christmas story, this is kind of a behind-the-scenes look at what's going on spiritually. That the dragon wants to destroy the son. The dragon wants to destroy the son. That is his goal, is to devour the son and keep him from fulfilling what God has promised he would do. So to really get a full picture of this moment, again, this is big picture, looking at God's plan from the beginning. You go back to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve uh, sin, the serpent is there that tempts them and leads them into sin, uh, and God comes down and finds them, and there is a curse that Satan uh, is given. God pronounces a curse on the serpent at this time in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 and this is really a key verse for understanding a lot of what happens in scripture after this so God speaking to the serpent back in Genesis 3 says this I will put enmity and that word enmity means uh, conflict struggle I will put enmity or conflict between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers he will crush your head and you will strike his heel so here's the thing from this moment Satan knows that God has a plan, 
that an offspring of the woman would eventually crush his head and destroy him. Satan is given that revelation and understands that plan. And from this moment on, Satan's desire is to prevent this from happening. And that shows up not only throughout Scripture, but throughout history. That Satan tries to destroy God's plan and thwart God's plan somewhere along the way. In the book of Exodus, Pharaoh is having the young Hebrew babies killed. God's plan is trying to be destroyed in that moment. Throughout the Old Testament, as the Israelites move into the Promised Land and they fight battles against nations around them that are trying to keep them from moving into God's promise. That is going on. King David, well, before David is king, there's a king named Saul that tries to put David, the one who the line of the Messiah is supposed to come from, Saul tries to kill David at a point in the Old Testament. All the way through the Old Testament book of Esther, there's a man named Haman that comes up with a plot, and his plot is to wipe out the Jewish people. Then through the time between the Old and New Testaments, historically, there are nations that come in and conquer the Israelites and continue to oppress them all the way through the time of Jesus. And when Jesus' birth arrives, if you know the Christmas story, there's a king named Herod. And Herod, when he finds out about the birth of Jesus, he tries to go and, and have the baby killed. He wants to find out where the baby is born so that he can go and kill the baby. That is, again, behind every one of those things is the enormous red dragon of Satan trying to thwart God's plan. So the next time you hear about the Christmas story or read the Christmas story and read that part about Herod and him trying to, to have the baby destroyed, picture behind him the red dragon of Satan trying to block God's plan. Even after the ministry of Jesus, the Jewish people continue to be attacked through the time of the Romans and then the Greek Empire. After that, the Turkish and the Ottoman Empires that come along uh, all the way through the Crusades. God's, uh, the, the Israelites continue to be attacked even through modern history, where there's Nazi Germany, under Soviet Russia, where millions of Jews were killed, all the way through now in current politics, where there are nations whose stated intent is to wipe Israel off the map. Behind every one of those things is the red dragon that is there, trying to wipe Israel out. And part of that, even for the future, is that if there's going to be these 144,000 evangelist Jewish people that are proclaiming the message that we've seen back in Revelation chapter 7, God wants to wipe them out so they can't do that. Uh, God, Satan has continued, I mean, Satan has continued his desire to wipe Israel from being part of God's future kingdom, of God's plan. Satan's opposition to the Jewish people has continued throughout history. But God, through all that, continues to maintain a remnant of his people. Whether they are believing in him or not, God still is faithful to, to maintain a remnant of his people. And he continues to do that. And so, in this passage, it goes on. She gave birth to a son, a male child. And it says he will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and his throne. So we're given some more description of his son. Uh, the son is, is raised up in this passage. And in verse 5, right here, you have the shortest description you will ever find of the life and ministry of Jesus. Because it starts, he's born, he's snatched up to heaven, and he reigns. That's a really quick way of describing everything that goes on with Christ. That the Son is raised up, that he goes to the throne of God, where it says he reigns with an iron scepter. And that's a passage, or a verse that's taken from Psalm chapter 2, uh, a messianic psalm that describes the future Messiah. And so the Son is raised up, and then we see in verse 6, the woman uh, fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. And so we see in this next verse that the woman representing Israel is protected. Now, something that frequently happens in prophetic literature is that there's frequently a jump from one time period to another time period of a, a tremendous amount of time. And I think that's what's happening here is that this is a fast forward from the birth of Christ, the ascension of Christ, all the way forward to the time of tribulation. And Israel is going to be protected during this last half of the tribulation. The 1260 days is a reference to three and a half years at the, the last half of the tribulation. The woman will be protected during that time. And so we've got this big picture again of the woman giving birth to a son. The dragon is trying to oppose God's plan. But then we're given another picture of something else going on in the spiritual realm. In verses 7 through 10, there is a spiritual battle that is taking place. 
again, behind the scenes of these things that are going on in, in Revelation. And I believe this is a reference to a future battle yet to come. You know, there has been an ongoing spiritual conflict, but at this point there's a specific uh, all-out war that kind of breaks out. Verse 7 says, Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. So again, there's this war that breaks out in heaven, and there are two sides to this war. There is Michael, uh, who in Daniel chapter 12, Michael is called uh, the prince who protects your people. He has called that to Daniel, and that's a, re a reference that Michael is specifically an angel that is given protection over the people of Israel. And so there is Michael and his angels that are fighting against the dragon or Satan and his angels, what we would call demons that are fallen angels. And so there is this war that has broken out in heaven. And I want you to think of any movie scene you may have seen where there's like an epic battle taking place, whether it's something like a World War II movie or a Civil War movie or maybe even some of those fictional movies like the Lord of the Rings movies where there's like the big giant army of the evil orcs and there's like the big army of the good guys going against. Picture whatever amazing epic battle scene that you can picture and I think that doesn't come close to what's going on here with this battle that takes place. But verse 8 gives us the conclusion of the battle. Verse 8 and 9 says, but he, meaning the dragon, uh, that he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. And so we see the results of this battle. The, the devil is hurled down. The dragon is hurled down. And this word for hurled down is a really violent image. This is the idea of you know, if you watch wrestling, this is like the full-on body slam of picking somebody up. It is a violent image of being thrown down, of being cast out, of being hurled down. So the dragon is hurled down. It's described as saying he was not strong enough. And so the dragon and his demons lost their place in this spiritual realm. We'll talk about that in a minute. But as the dragon is talked about being hurled down, uh, there's kind of a, a four-part description that is given of the dragon at this point. And I think these are here, again, to remind us of who our enemy is and what he does. There's a four-part description given of the dragon. He is called the ancient serpent. And again, that's a reference back to Genesis chapter 3, when the deceiver first shows up and deceives Adam and Eve. The ancient serpent is described. Then he is called the devil. The Greek word for that is diabolos, which means the, the accuser or the slanderer, the one who speaks against God's plan and against God's people. He is the accuser or the slanderer. Verse three, or number three, he is called Satan. He is the adversary or enemy. And Satan is a, a Hebrew word that simply means adversary or enemy, the one who comes against us and against God. And then last, he's called the one who leads the whole world astray. That means he is the deceiver. Jesus called Satan the father of lies. And so Satan is the deceiver as well, that is able to even lead the whole world astray, that there are many that follow him and follow his pattern. He draws the whole world system after himself. So there are all these descriptions of Satan that are given here. And then just a reminder that he is hurled down. Uh, there's a man named George Barna that runs an organization called the Barna Group, and they do surveys, uh, and a lot of times their surveys deal with spiritual issues and spiritual questions. And he did a large survey of a lot of people that identified themselves as Christians. And in this large group of people that identified themselves as Christians, over half of them did not believe that Satan was a real being who exists, but that he is only a representation of evil. That's from a lot of people that claim to be Christians. Uh, there's a French philosopher by the name of Baudelaire who came up with this, this phrase, and then it was made popular a few years ago in a, in a movie. The quote is this, The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. You know, that if Satan can get people to not even think he's even really there, he's one part of the battle right there, because then he can go about doing what he wants to do and accomplishing what he wants to accomplish. Now, C.S. Lewis addressed uh, this idea of whether you believe in demons or not. He said, there are two equal and opposite errors into which we can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. So you have this, this, these two opposite things. There are some people that just don't even believe uh, the devil exists and that it's just kind of a symbol of things. Uh, but you can also err in the other way too far and become so obsessed with this idea of demons that it kind of opens you up to 
their negative influence. And there's a good warning there about that. Now in verses 10 through 13, we get into more details of what happened in this battle and how the battle was won. Revelation 12 verses 10 through 13 gives us a picture of how this battle was won. Uh, verse 10 says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. So we're making a proclamation, a declaration of something that has happened. And first off, there is a declaration of, of praise for the salvation that has come from God, uh, praise for God's power, for his reign, for the authority of Jesus. So there's a declaration of praise. And then there is a declaration of what has happened as a result of this battle. And what has happened is that the accuser, our enemy, the dragon, has been expelled. The accuser has been expelled. The accuser has been cast out. And Satan no longer has opportunity to accuse believers. Now, this is a really hard thing to, to wrap your mind around, and I don't quite get exactly how this works. But up to this point, when this battle takes place, Satan has somehow still had access to the heavenly realm where he accuses us. He has been able to have some kind of access to God. And we see that in the book of Job in the Old Testament. It's referred to in Ephesians chapter 6 when it talks about we war against uh, the enemies in the heavenly realms. So somehow, uh, Satan and his demons still have some kind of heavenly access. And again, I don't quite get how that works. Uh, Pastor John MacArthur puts it this way when he writes this. Satan currently divides his time between roaming the earth, seeking someone to devour, and being in the heavenly realm, where he also engages in his doomed attempt to overthrow God's person, purposes, plans, and people. Satan ceaselessly bothers God about the unworthiness of believers, appealing to God's righteousness uh, to further his own unrighteous aims. The goal of his accusations is to shatter the bonds that link believers to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no possibility of that happening. Still, Satan works on earth to turn God's children against him and in heaven to turn God against his children. But saving faith and eternal life are unbreakable realities. So somehow Satan is, is as he's called, is the accuser is warring against God and warring against us and trying to turn us against one another. But that is a useless effort on his part. But at this point, in this future battle that takes place, Satan is then banished even from this opportunity and this limited access to do this. He is struck down to earth. And we're given more details in verse 11 about what has happened and how that has happened. Verse 11 says, They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Well, now, wait a second. If you remember back, we started talking about this battle. Who is fighting this battle? What's angels and demons are talked about as the ones that are fighting this battle? But verse 11 says they triumphed over him. Well, who is the they talking about? I think it's talking about in verse 10, right before, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ. That in the midst of this battle... There are people, there are brothers and sisters, our fellow believers, believers that have died for their faith, whether it's during the time of tribulation or believers throughout history that have died for their faith. Uh, their lives somehow have an impact on the spiritual battle that takes place. That earthly events have an influence on the spiritual battle. Yes, the victory over the evil one is accomplished by these angels, but somehow it seems they are empowered or there is something that is done by uh, the things that are listed here, the actions of believers somehow have an impact on this spiritual battle. And how does that happen? Well, the next verse tells us, or that verse goes on, and it gives us details, that the enemy is overcome by the blood of the Lamb. The enemy is overcome by the blood of the Lamb. Now, Revelation chapter 4 uh, talks about a vision of Jesus as the Lamb who was slain. Uh, John, in referring to Jesus, calls him the, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When we talk about the blood of the Lamb, it's talking about the blood of Jesus and all that the blood of Jesus accomplishes for us. And if you go through the New Testament and look at what different things the Bible tells us that the blood of Jesus does for us, I'm going to give you a, a list of some of the things that the blood of Christ accomplishes for us. And don't try to write all these things down. I'm going to run through them pretty fast. But it is amazing to look at what the blood of Christ accomplishes for us. First, the church has been purchased through the blood of the Lamb. The church has its foundations 
in the blood of the Lamb. We are justified. We are saved from God's wrath through His blood. The atonement, the bringing us back into a relationship with God, is accomplished through the blood of Christ. We are brought near to God. Uh, redemption, our forgiveness of sins, is through the blood of the Lamb. Peace is made between us and God through the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ even brings peace between people that have been in conflict. The blood of Christ cleanses us, gives us confidence before God, makes us holy, purifies us from all sin, and has freed us from our sins. That's a short description from the New Testament of what the blood of Christ has accomplished for us. That is the power of the blood of the Lamb, of our Savior Jesus. The second thing that overcomes the enemy is the word of their testimony. It says they overcame by the word of their testimony. This is proclaiming his word and the effect that it has had on their lives. A public declaration of their faith in Christ and of his word. Speaking of their faith and how God has transformed them. You know, do you speak of your faith to others? Your testimony, your story of how God has worked in your life has power. Whether you think it's a really exciting story or whether you don't think it is, your story has power. When you share with others about what Christ has done in your life, it has power. In this story, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and then last, by their sacrificial living. Their sacrificial living. It says they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death or to, to run away from death, to be fearful of death. They did not love their lives so much that they were fearful of death. They lived sacrificial lives. In 2004, there was a, a woman by the name of Karen Watson who was a missionary in North Africa, uh, North Iraq. Uh, her and three other missionaries uh, in 2004, as they were serving with the, the Southern Baptist Mission Board in Iraq, were killed in an ambush. And there's a letter that she left for her pastors in case she was killed while she was on the mission field. And this letter, in part, read this. You should only be opening this letter in the event of death. When God calls, there are no regrets. I tried to share my heart with you as much as possible, my heart for the nations. I wasn't called to a place. I was called to him. To obey was my objective. To suffer was expected. His glory was my reward. His glory is my reward. That's just one story of a modern-day believer who did not love her life so much as to shrink from the possibility of death. You can find countless stories throughout history of people that have followed Christ to that point. And this future time of persecution that's coming during the tribulation is going to be much worse and much more difficult. So in your life, what do you have a tendency to shrink back from or become fearful of? Most of us aren't going to face death as we have our walk with Christ. So there are other things that can still sometimes cause us to shrink back, to be fearful, even if they're not that significant. Maybe it's being embarrassed about identifying yourself as a Christian, not wanting to stand out in a crowd, getting into temptation when something difficult faces you. Awkward social situations. There are all sorts of different things that we may tend to shrink back from, even that don't approach death. But when we walk with Christ, when we have confidence in the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, we will not shrink back from any of those things. Because the things that are effective, the things that are effective for this future battle, the things that are effective for this future battle going on are just as effective and powerful for us right now. We overcome our enemy by the blood of the Lamb, by our security in believing what Christ has done for us. By the word of our testimony, by talking to others about what Christ has done, and by living sacrificially, loving others and giving to others, those things have power for us right now. Verse 12 goes on and tells us more about uh, what has happened as a result of this battle. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. So part of the battle has ended. Satan has been spiritually defeated and exiled to earth during this time of tribulation. There is a, a spiritual victory, a rejoicing in the heavens. Uh, but it's still only a partial victory. Because you see what this says, rejoice, O heavens. Uh, the, the enemy is cast down, but woe to the earth and to the sea. You know, the tribulation is about to go from bad to worse. Satan is filled with fury, and he's going to take this out during this last part of the tribulation on earth. 
And the devil is filled with fury. He knows his time is short. Now I also wonder, as a, as a defeated enemy, if somehow Satan has deceived himself into believing there is still something he can do to change God's plan. That's the only reason someone keeps fighting this kind of battle. That Satan has deceived himself into thinking, you know, it's not really going to end this way, the way that it's written. I can change what's been talked about. I think Satan has that mentality that he can still make some kind of change, that he still has some kind of chance. And so during the tribulation, things on earth go from bad to worse as the tribulation ramps up through Satan and his demons being cast to earth. And you might ask the question, well, why doesn't God just deal with Satan all at one time and just be done with it? And my best answer for that is, I don't know. Um, as you see this, this unfold, it seems like God's defeat of Satan unfolds in stages as we look at it from our perspective. But back in Genesis chapter 3, when Jesus said, when uh, God says, uh, your head will be crushed, Satan's defeat is accomplished at that moment. But we see it from our perspective unfold in stages. When Jesus dies on the cross and is risen from the dead, that is a defeat for Satan and his power over death. And Jesus demonstrates his power over Satan in that. Uh, through these future battles that take place as Satan is defeated and cast down. And then later in the book of Revelation, when Satan faces his final ultimate defeat, we see this victory over Satan unfold in stages. But throughout that, God's plan is unfolded. Throughout that, God is accomplishing his purposes that we don't fully understand, but we can see him accomplishing what he wants to accomplish. But it's also important for us to understand that a defeated enemy is still a dangerous enemy. A defeated enemy can still be a dangerous enemy. You see this throughout history. When a war is over and a war is like officially over and they've signed the peace treaties and whatever, in a lot of wars there's still somebody that holds out and keeps fighting the battle even after the battle has been declared over. There are holdouts, and I think that's what Satan is. He is holding out to the last opportunity. Even though it's declared that he is a defeated enemy, he is continuing to fight to try to accomplish his own purposes. And so we see in the next few verses, Satan continuing his attempt to destroy God's plan. Verses 13 through 17, we see the determination of the dragon here. It says, when the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth... He pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness, where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time out of the serpent's reach. Now what we see here is the woman, again representing Israel, continues to be protected. The woman continues to be protected. And it says she will be cared for uh, for a time, times, and a half of time. And again, that's a reference to three and a half years, the 1260 days mentioned earlier, uh, that she is out of the serpent's reach, that the woman is being protected during this tribulation period. And this image of, of being carried on eagle's wings is a reference God uses, a, a, a symbol that God uses way back in the book of Exodus to talk about his rescuing his people. When he wrote in Exodus 19, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. So again, you've got that image of, God being of God's people being protected, carried on eagle's wings. Then verse 15 in Revelation 12 says, Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. So the serpent continues with an all-out attack on the nation of Israel. And this could literally be a flood, like trying to send waters to flood uh, the Israelites, or it could represent a, a flood of attackers or of armies or of soldiers that are coming after the nation of Israel. But again, they are still protected. It says somehow something with the earth protects them. And either God sends them to a place where they are safe in mountains or caves, or there could even be an earthquake or something that happens that helps protect the nation of Israel. But the key thing is that Israel continues to be protected. And Satan is still not happy about that at all. So verse 17, the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. So what we see in verse 17 is an ongoing war against believers, an ongoing war against those who have come to faith during this time of tribulation, an ongoing war against the believers that are there. The dragon continues to wage war against believers here whether it's Jewish people or non-Jewish people that have become believers in Jesus' time. 
and how the dragon carries on these attacks, we'll see in the next couple of chapters, in the next couple of weeks, the way Satan carries out these attacks. But even though this chapter has kind of big picture ideas and big symbols and just different things that are going on, and even though this chapter has a, a ultimate fulfillment in future events, there are some really important truths that impact our lives and what we believe right here and right now. So a few of those really important truths. Uh, first off, there is a real spiritual battle. There is a real spiritual battle. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, and against the authorities, and against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The things we struggle against are not just <coughs> flesh and blood. Whether it's when you're dealing with temptation, when you're dealing with conflict with other people, if you've got struggles that you are dealing with, if you've got people or things that are coming against you, not all the time, but frequently there is a spiritual attack behind those things. There is a real spiritual battle that is going on. And when you deal with those things, you need to be aware and rely on your prayers and your time with God and strength from God to deal with those things so that you are not fighting on your own in flesh and blood. There is a real spiritual battle. And along with that real spiritual battle, the actions of believers, the actions of you and I that call ourselves Christians, our actions on earth make a difference in the spiritual realities. When we say our prayers, when we live out our faith, when we speak about the word of our testimony, when we seek to do good in the lives of others, whatever the ways that we live out our faith, it's, it's clear through scripture that somehow that makes a difference for eternity. That makes a difference in the spiritual battle that is ongoing. The things that we do and the way we live out our faith have an impact on the spiritual battle and on eternity. And then it's also important for us to know we have an enemy who wants to destroy us. We have an enemy who wants to destroy us. Again, Satan's goal, Jesus said, is to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he is after, whether it's putting a divide between us and God or bringing destruction into our lives in some other way. Uh, Satan wants to destroy us. But fortunately, we have a Savior who is greater than any enemy. We have a Savior who is greater than any enemy. Because of the blood of the Lamb, because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we have victory over that enemy. And then God will spiritually protect those who are his. God will spiritually protect those who are his. From the Christian that dies when they're 100 years old to the missionary that dies at an earlier age than anybody would have thought, God's hand is still with them, securing them spiritually. When we put our faith and trust in Christ, we are secure. We are in his hands. We are forever secure with him from the moment we put our faith and trust in him. And then last, God will accomplish his purposes. God will accomplish his purposes. Even when there is an all-out assault from the enemy to destroy it and derail God's plan, God's plan cannot be stopped. God will accomplish his purposes. And my hope for you this morning is that knowing and understanding that God will accomplish his purposes will give you more confidence in your faith right now that you will have the confidence in Christ to live boldly in speaking your testimony, to have confidence in what Christ has done for you, to live sacrificially, to honor the gift that he has given us. And I would encourage you, if you never have, that you would let today be the day that you put your faith and your trust in Christ, that you accept and believe in his blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins so that your future would be secure as well, and you would experience that victory in your own life. I'm going to pray for us. Uh, the majority is going to come, and we have a, an opportunity to continue to respond to what Christ has done for us, and sing about how he has overcome, and how we overcome as well. And you'll see some of those words in the song that we're going to sing. And during that time of uh, opportunity to respond to worship, if you'd like to come forward and, and have someone pray for you about anything that's going on uh, in your life, we'll have some of our elders that are down front. Uh, to pray with you. So let me pray for us this morning. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for uh, just the truth of your word. We thank you for what you accomplished through sending your son uh, to die on the cross. That through the blood of the lamb, we have forgiveness of our sins and we have eternal life when we put our faith and trust in you. And I do pray this morning, if there is anyone that has never 
have trusted in Christ, has never stepped over that line of faith, saying, yes, Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, that they would do that this morning. And Father, for those of us that are uh, believers and followers of you, I pray that this morning we would have greater confidence in understanding what, what the blood of the Lamb has accomplished for us, that we would have greater boldness in sharing the word of our testimony, uh, that we would live sacrificially in a way that honors you and seeks to glorify you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's stand as we sing one more song together as our elders come forward for prayer. Seated above, in the Father's love. Destined to die, poured out for all mankind. God's only Son, perfect and spotless one.